Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Shannon Miller and I'm one of the two Ath Fellows. It's not every night at the Ath that we throw around the word genius, but then it's not every day that our speaker has received the formal award for being one. Lieutenant Colonel Margaret Stock is an attorney and 2013 recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, commonly known as the Genius Grant, who speaks widely on issues of immigration law and national security. With experience serving in the U.S. Army Reserve and teaching at West Point, Stock challenges complex federal immigration laws in order to provide more humane and rational policies that will also serve American national security interests. Too often, conversations about the intersections between immigration and national security devolve into discussions about keeping the wrong people out rather than bringing the right people in. In, respo in response, Stock brings her singular knowledge of immigration law and national security law to bear on reform efforts through direct representation and policy-based advocacy. Stock articulates the crucial role of a healthy and efficient immigration system in responding to changes in the global economy and maintaining the foundational values of our democracy. Margaret Stock has spearheaded the development of three groundbreaking programs that creatively adapt existing laws to better the lives of both immigrants and native-born military personnel, including the Military Accessions Vital to the National Interest Program, which allows the U.S. Armed Forces to attract and retain foreign nationals with language, medical, and other skills critical to military readiness and national security by expediting their path to citizenship. As always, audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Margaret Stock to the Athenaeum. Well, I'm very excited to be here because I'm from Alaska. And this morning, it was four degrees. So thank you so much for the invitation. I don't know how you get any work done around here. You don't? OK, I got it. Uh, yes, I'm from Alaska, and uh, I can see Russians from my house. Really, I, I have a Russian neighbor. I say, it's when I walk to the mailbox every day. Um, but seriously, I like to start these talks about immigration by telling everyone a deep, dark secret of Alaska immigration history. We're the only state that has ever had an unauthorized immigrant as our governor. It was not Sarah Palin. <laughs> now, it was somebody named John Franklin Strong, and he was the territorial governor of Alaska in the early 1900s. The bureaucrats in Washington did not check his papers before they appointed him territorial governor of our great territory at the time, Alaska. And he was outed when his other wife showed up from Canada looking for him. He had two wives. Um, yeah, he said back then it was tough to get a divorce, you know. So, so he fled our state and went back to Canada for a while, and uh, we lost our governor temporarily until they found somebody else. But, so I'd like to start by talking about that. And tonight I'm going to be talking to you about a little bit about why I ended up being named a MacArthur Foundation Fellow. And I do need to tell you, in the interest of full disclosure, that I'm not a genius. Um, the MacArthur Foundation does not call this grant the Genius Grant. That is a term that the news media came up with. Uh, but they do award the grants for, uh, to people who they say have been very creative in their field of endeavor. So I'm going to tell you tonight a little bit about how I ended up qualifying for one of these lucky people. You get a magic phone call, for those of you who don't know it, um, complete, you can't apply for this. Somebody secretly nominates you, they do some investigation, you have no idea what's going on, and then one day you're sitting in your office and you get a phone call from somebody and they say, this is so-and-so from the MacArthur Foundation and you are one of our fellows. And you go, really? And you think it's a practical joke, one of your friends is playing on you. Uh, but they say, no, we're giving you $625,000 and you can do whatever you want. And there's no reporting requirement. But one of the things I feel compelled to do, having been the recipient of one of these wonderful awards, is to tell people a little, a little bit about the creativity uh, that, that they recognized. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that tonight. They said I had done three things that were very creative. One was setting up a pro bono program for lawyers to volunteer their services to help military families with immigration problems. Uh, the second thing was starting up or restarting basic training naturalization, which is a program for immigrants serving in the U.S. military to get their citizenship while they're at basic training in the military. When they graduate, they get their citizenship. 
and this was actually not my idea. We did it in World War I and World War II and so forth, but I was the person that pointed out that we used to do it and they started it up again. And then the last thing, which is the one I'm primarily gonna focus on tonight, is the military accessions vital to the National Interest Program. Because I think this program illustrates, like no other program, that immigration reform is possible, that we don't actually need Congress to act, and since Congress is very dysfunctional these days, um, you know, doing something that doesn't require congressional action can often be uh, pretty important. And I think it also is a great illustration of how the dysfunction of the U.S. current legal immigration system can offer opportunities for people who are willing to take those opportunities. So let me get started. And uh, I'm going to wander around a little bit because I, I have a light in my eyes if I don't do that. And also I want to um, talk to people in the audience a little bit. So I want to start with this quote. Um, those of you who l watched the movie Legally Blonde <laughs> probably remember this quote, law is reason free from passion, right? The law professor on the first day of law school asks the student in the class, who said this? And then he has to bet the life of his fellow student on you know, whether Aristotle said it or not. Yes, Aristotle supposedly said this, of course, in Greek. And this is our concept of what law is supposed to be. Law is supposed to be something that's rational and logical. It's reason free from passion. I've been an immigration lawyer, though, since 1993. And I can tell you that US immigration law is the opposite. It is passion free from reason. And I'm going to make the case for that tonight in talking with you. But in order to get started, I know I'm at Claremont McKenna, and we want to go back to the beginning, and we want to think about the origins of the republic and what our founders thought about immigration. So, this is the Declaration of Independence, and very few people know this, but when we broke away from the King of England, we had an immigration grievance. We had a really big immigration grievance, and it's up there for you. It's a little bit dark there, I think, in red, but um, he has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others, to encourage their migration hither. So looking back, one of the reasons why we broke away from England was we were upset about their immigration policy. They were restricting immigration. And people sort of forget this, but this is actually part of our national history that long ago we were an open borders country. And in fact, open borders are what made America into a superpower eventually. We welcomed immigrants from all around the world, we brought people who had the get up and go to come to the US to travel here. They were interested in doing that for whatever reason. And they had brought a different quality, a different personality to the American um, democracy than we would have gotten otherwise. So remembering that history is important because if we fast forward today, we still have this national myth. And I'll tell you in a minute why it's a myth, but we believe that we're the country that welcomes immigrants. We're the nation of immigrants. And this is no better epitomized by the poem from Emma Lazarus. Many of you may have had to memorize this when you were in elementary school. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Now, I say this is a national myth because today, America does not want anybody who is tired or poor or huddled or yearning to breathe free. We do not want people like that immigrating to the United States of America. And we make it virtually impossible for anybody who's tired or poor or huddled to immigrate legally to America. We have a lot of people coming who are tired and poor and huddled, but they're not coming with a visa, okay? Now, we do accept a very tiny number of refugees. We have a country of 320 million people today. And every year, the president sets a quota for refugees. And typically, it's somewhere between 70,000 and 100,000. Okay, think about the math. A country of 320 million people, we take a drop in the bucket when it comes to refugees as a percentage of that population every year. So we no longer are really a nation that welcomes immigrants, at least not legal immigrants. And so this is a national myth. The reality is much different. Today in America, we have somewhere between 8 and 20 million people who are not supposed to be here, according to the government. Now, the estimates vary widely. There's one government estimate, low end, 8 million. 20 million is a Bear Stearns report that came out, a private enterprise report. The government officially says today there are about 11.5 million unauthorized immigrants. That's based on their best calculations. Now, you know, if people have a range like this, that means nobody really knows how many people there are. There's just a lot, okay? 
We also have backlogs and quotas for legal immigration that are crazy. We have some people, if you file a visa petition for that person today, they're gonna have to wait 105 years in order to immigrate legally. Most people aren't gonna live that long. So by the time it's their opportunity to come legally, they're gonna be dead because they signed up today. We have fewer and fewer foreigners living in America with green cards because it's become very difficult to get a green card. So more and more people are living in the US for long periods of time in some status short of a green card. They have an F1 foreign student visa. They have a J1 visa. They have an H1B or an E or an L or an O. There's 80 plus different categories of non-immigrant visas that people have. And people are in these statuses for years and years and decades and decades and sometimes 20 or 30 years and they can never ever get a green card. We also finally have a legal system that is a mess. And I'm gonna give you some more examples of this but the best quote I ever heard on this was an official spokesperson for the Department of Homeland Security saying on the record in the Washington Post that immigration law is a mystery and a mastery of obfuscation. Now I'm here with an educated audience so you know what obfuscation means and you know that's not a compliment to the state of the law. Especially not coming from the agency that's tasked to implement this law. They were, to be fair, uh, responding with this comment and this quote in, in response to a congressional investigation when they had messed up a case, somebody's immigration case, and they were trying to defend themselves. And they're basically saying, hey, the law is too difficult, we don't understand it, okay, even though we're the agency that has to carry it out. So this is our national reality, and I wanna emphasize a little bit more because I'm a lawyer about the immigration law part of it. Immigration law is a part of the mess. This is a quote from a federal judge, and it's an old quote, but things have not gotten any better since this federal judge gave this quote. And the federal judge said that immigration law is like King Minos's labyrinth in ancient Crete. The tax laws and the Immigration and Nationality Act, examples we've cited of Congress's ingenuity in passing statutes certain to accelerate the aging process of judges. This is not a compliment. This is polite legal language, but it's not a compliment. And then finally, my last piece of evidence comes from the Huffington Post. This is a blog written by a very expert immigration law professor from Boston College Law School. She teaches immigration law every day. And she's written a terrific blog where she's gone out and found all these court cases where federal judges and even the US Supreme Court said wrong things about immigration law. And she wrote a blog and she said, raise your hand if you understand immigration law. And she points out in the blog that immigration law is a complete mess. The law is complex, counterintuitive, and just plain confusing. And if you keep reading this blog, and I'm not gonna bore you with the whole thing, she basically points out that even the United States Supreme Court, the nine top jurists in the country, get immigration law wrong. They did that a few months ago in a court case. There's a whole paragraph in a decision written by Elena Kagan, who used to be the dean at Harvard Law School, and the whole paragraph is completely wrong. So even a Harvard-educated former Harvard dean on the United States Supreme Court can't get immigration law right because it's too complicated. This is our legal system, and the Supreme Court can't get it right, but it's really Congress that's to blame for a lot of this, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so let me move on to the reality of this complicated system. I've just given you the background on that and how it works for the average person. This is a diagram I like to call the path to citizenship. How many of you have heard of the path to citizenship? Okay, a bunch of people. Okay, that's good. Notice how it's nice and neat and clean and you can get on this path and you proceed from being an alien. That's a legal term. It means you're not a citizen or national of the United States. You proceed on that path and you go through your non-immigrant visa and you get your immigrant visa, your green card, and then you get your citizenship, right? It's really simple. All you gotta do if you're an alien is get on that path and eventually you will become a citizen. Now for most people this path doesn't exist because although most of the world are aliens, most of them can't get a non-immigrant visa. It's very difficult to get one of those. And fewer can qualify for a green card. And even the ones who get a green card, it's hard to become a citizen. The government denies lots and lots of citizenship applications every year. So even the people who qualify have a hard time with this, but most people can't get on this path at all. But the ones who do, it typically takes somewhere between five and 15 years for the average person to negotiate the path from being an alien to being a US citizen, if they qualify. And this is, for example, somebody from Britain 
who goes to a top American school, maybe Claremont McKenna, and then gets a H-1B visa, and the employer sponsors them for a green card, and maybe they're an outstanding professor or researcher. It's going to be five to 15 years before they get from alien to being citizen. That's a long path for most people. There aren't really too many shortcuts for this. The average person, though, has a very different picture from this nice, neat path. This is what the average person is going to face. Now, you don't have to read this. Okay, this is just for visual shock effect. This is a diagram that was published in Reason Magazine several years ago, and it's an actual diagram of how to get a green card. Now, notice those little red things in there. Those are stop, you don't qualify. If the average person tries to follow this flow chart, they're going to hit one of those stop, you don't qualify. Because the reality today is there's a very complicated path that ends in stop, you don't qualify for most people. It's not that easy path that I diagrammed previously for you. Most people just can't qualify for a green card at all. They can try to follow all these different patterns and charts and everything. They're basically going to be best friends with an immigration lawyer, somebody like me, for 10 or 15 years, and they may still not qualify. They're going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars. This is the reality of America's legal immigration system today. It's a mess, kind of like this flow chart. Jeb Bush wrote a book calls it Immigration Wars. And I think the book lays out the best metaphor for the US's legal immigration system today. Jeb calls it a leaky dam. A dam is supposed to provide power. It captures the water. It provides the power and electricity. The immigration system is supposed to provide power to America's economy. It's supposed to provide us with the energetic people we need to be workers and scientists and researchers and professors and so forth. If the dam works correctly, we get a lot of power out of it. If the immigration system works correctly, we get a lot of power out of it. But today, our immigration system is a leaky dam. It's been patched so many times. It's been rebuilt. There's holes in it. There's water coming through all over the place. It's not providing the power that we need to power our national economy anymore. It's completely broken. And Jeb Bush's prescription for this is we tear this dam out and we build a new one, one that's a type of dam that can power America's 21st century economy. I think that's a great metaphor. I'm going to walk you through a little couple of examples of this. Now, everybody says, whose fault is this that we have a leaky dam in America today? It's not Ronald Reagan's fault. He actually tried to fix it because this problem is not new. In 1986, when Ronald Reagan was president, we had the same problem with our immigration system. It wasn't quite as much of a mess as it is today, but it was still a mess. We had hordes of unauthorized immigrants in the country. We had businesses breaking the law right and left. We had a big mess on our hands, no way to immigrate legally. We had porous borders. Ronald Reagan looked at the immigration system, and he looked at it much the same way he looked at the tax code back then. He said, gosh, we got this really complicated legal regime, and we're a nation of lawbreakers. We're just breaking the law right and left. We're breaking the tax laws right and left. We're breaking the immigration laws right and left. I have an option as chief executive. I could just hire a lot of IRS agents to implement the, the tax laws that nobody's complying with and that everybody can't understand and thinks are incomprehensible. Or we could have tax reform. And he got comprehensive tax reform through in 1984. He tried the same argument and the same thing with the immigration system. He went to Congress. He said, immigration system's a mess. We're a nation of lawbreakers. Look at all these unauthorized immigrants. This is really stupid. We're a superpower. We shouldn't have a legal system like this. Let's fix it. And Congress said, OK, Mr. President, we'll step up to the plate. And they passed something, the Immigration Reform and Control Act in 1986, that I call the three-legged stool. It wasn't exactly what Ronald Reagan wanted. It was a stool with three legs, border enforcement. We're going to step up enforcement of the border. We're going to have an amnesty for people who are in the country unlawfully but meet certain requirements. They don't have a criminal background. They're paying their taxes. They have good moral character. They're good people. They're going to come forward and pay a fine, speak English. We're going to have an amnesty. That's another leg of the stool. And the third thing is, for the first time in American history, we're going to solve this immigration problem. We know what's causing it. It's jobs. And if we dry up those jobs for the unauthorized immigrants, they won't come to America anymore. 
Now, there's two ways you can dry up jobs. One, you can tank your economy. You can go into the basement, and if there's no jobs for anybody, the immigrants aren't going to come because there's no jobs for anybody. But we don't want to do that. That's not really good for the rest of America. We can dry up the jobs, though, if we have a federal law that says every employer in America has to check people's immigration status when they come to work. So we're going to outsource the enforcement of immigration law to every employer in America. And starting in 1986, for the first time in American history, American employers had to check people's immigration status. Now, fast back to uh, the Declaration of Independence, the founders would have been appalled by this. They probably didn't think the federal government had the power to tell a human being they couldn't work. But in 1986, this was considered a good compromise. So we got the three-legged stool, border enforcement, amnesty, and we're going to have work, work site enforcement. Problem is, it's a three-legged stool. They didn't fund the border security. The employer sanctions and the worksite enforcement were not well thought out or workable. So the three-legged stool ended up with two legs that were a little short and wobbly, and the whole thing basically fell over. Now, Ronald Reagan wanted a fourth leg to the stool, and he didn't get that. The fourth leg that he wanted was a system for people to immigrate legally in the future, to meet the needs of American businesses and American families. And he could not get Congress to do that. Congress agreed to the three legs of the stool, but not for a future flow of legal immigration. So we ended up with the mess continuing, the three-legged stool fell over, and we're back to the same situation today, but just magnified. And of course, we know who to blame for this, not Ronald Reagan, right? On September 11th, 2001, our nation was attacked. Now, I was in the Army on that day. I was actually uh, an Army Reserve officer, military police officer, but I was serving at West Point, teaching full-time. I was teaching constitutional and military law. And the planes that attacked the World Trade Center flew right down the Hudson River, right over West Point. Of course, we didn't know that, but they were using the Hudson River to, to guide the planes. And they hit the towers. And from the heights at West Point, we could see the towers burning. And that day, we were all very emotional. We were very upset. Our nation had been attacked. We knew I was in the military. We knew our nation was under attack. And it really did change things because the people who attacked us that day were all foreigners. And so the national, the national natural reaction that everybody had was our immigration system facilitated these attacks. If our immigration system weren't so screwed up and wouldn't let these terrorists in, because they all entered the US legally, we would not have been attacked on 9-11. And so that was the thinking that most people had that day. After 9-11, the American government went crazy on steroids, passing laws to try to stop future terrorist attacks. Perfectly understandable in light of what had happened. But we went a little crazy. We built a system designed to keep people out of the United States. And we forgot that a lot of our economic strength and our superpower status came from letting the right people into the US. We built, instead of a system that was going to let the right people in, we built a system that was designed to just keep as many people out as possible. And I've got a bunch of acronyms up here, and you don't need to know what they are, but every single one of these things was billed as an anti-terrorism measure. The I-9 form at work is going to catch terrorists. When employers fill it out, when they show up for work, we're going to catch a terrorist. The National Security Entry Exit Registration System, billions of dollars spent, not, not a single terrorist cop, but that was going to catch terrorists. The Real ID Act. Driver's licenses. If terrorists can't get driver's licenses, they won't be able to get on airplanes and crash them into buildings. We said that. A U.S. visit, a biometric entry exit system. The student exchange visitor information system. How many F1 students, J1s do we have in the room here? OK, you all are under the purview of the Department of Homeland Security, which is constantly checking to make sure whether you are taking your classes, because you might be a terrorist. And we know that if you drop a class, they might catch a terrorist, right? OK? So that was CVIS. Um, state laws were pitched as ways to catch terrorists. In my home state of Alaska, the legislators proposed a bill that was going to mess up our driver's license system incredibly. But they put a picture of Mohammed Atta, one of the 9-11 terrorists, in, in the legislative history, you know, the ads for the bill. Now, actually, I analyzed the bill, and I found out that Mohammed Atta would have gotten a driver's license under their bill. But that's how they were you know, appealing to people's emotions by trying to get this bill passed. And then the E-Verify system, an electronic system at the workplace that's designed eventually to it supplements the I-9 system. That was supposed to catch terrorists. And finally, people even said that voter ID 
is going to make America more secure by catching people who aren't supposed to be here and facilitating their deportation. So after 9-11, we basically went crazy with all the power and all the money of the US government trying to figure out new surveillance systems to try to catch the immigrants on the theory that one of those people might be a terrorist and we might be able to deport them before they attack us. This is perfectly understandable, but if you look at a big picture, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And I want to give you an example here of one of the absurdities that happened as a result of us going absolutely crazy to keep as many people out as possible. This is a story that was in the Washington Post. Samam Karim Ahmad, he was working at the Marine Corps base in Quantico, Virginia. He was teaching Iraqi Arabic to Marines who were deploying to Iraq. He'd been granted asylum in the United States, and he applied for a green card. But when he applied for a green card, they told him because of post 9-11 anti-terrorism laws, he could not have a green card. And the reason he could not have a green card was because under US law, he had provided material support to a terrorist organization. Now that sounds really bad, right? You don't want people getting green cards who provided support to a terrorist organization. Well, what had happened was Congress had redefined the, the term terrorist organization to include any group of two or more people who ever tried to overthrow a government. And he had been part of the Kurdish uprising. So he had tried to overthrow Saddam Hussein. So that made him part of a terrorist organization because two or more people who try to overthrow a government, he had tried to overthrow Saddam Hussein's government, and therefore that made him a terrorist under the technical definitions of our immigration law. So even though we had tried to overthrow Saddam Hussein, and we actually had, um, he was classified as a terrorist under post 9-11 immigration laws. I think most people would agree that this is absurd. And this is a little bit, you know, kind of the extreme example. But this is, in fact, a law that today is on the books. And the government still has not repealed this one. Um, they now give waivers, though, to people who are members of the um, Kurdish Democratic Party. But other people who try to overthrow foreign governments are barred. Like George Washington would be barred today as a terrorist. He tried to overthrow the British. You probably remember that, right? OK. So this is an example of some of the things that were happening. Now, the other thing that was going on was we're in the middle of a war. And in prior wars, immigrants had been critical to the United States military's success. This had started in 1775. George Washington at Valley Forge was recruiting immigrants. In fact, he was having his orders translated into German so that the German soldiers in the Continental Army could understand them. And when Baron von Steuben was giving orders at Valley Forge, he was trying to translate his orders into English until somebody tapped him on the shoulder and said, Baron, you don't have to translate your orders into English because all these soldiers understand German. 1775, the army was recruiting immigrants. In the Civil War period, the Irish were fleeing Britain and signing up in droves for the army. They were signing up for both the Union and the Confederate Army, but luckily the Union Army got more of them. And the Irish, in fact, were probably responsible for the victory of the Union at, Val at um, Gettysburg, another Pennsylvania location you might be familiar with. World War I. 18% of the US Army was immigrant. World War II, instead of deporting Germans who were in the United States, we drafted them and told them to raise their right hand and become American citizens. That way, instead of Hitler getting them as manpower, the US Army got them as manpower. Did the same thing with Italians and other folks that were in um, the United States at the time. But by 9-11, things had changed. We had kind of forgotten all of this history, and by 9-11, the government had made it really difficult for immigrants to join the military. The reason they made it difficult was they had imposed a green card requirement. You had to have a green card if you wanted to join the military. This was the first time in American history that you had to have a green card to join the military. Previously, in all other wars, we would take any qualified person, regardless of their immigration status, who wanted to sign up. Uh, during the Vietnam War, my favorite story about this is uh, an undocumented immigrant from Mexico who was drafted into the US Army. He was sent over to Vietnam. He won the Congressional Medal of Honor. They made him an American citizen because of his military service. And then they made him the director of selective service. So he went from being a drafted, unauthorized immigrant to being in charge of drafting other people. Even today, our draft laws say that if you're an unauthorized immigrant in America, you are required to sign up for the draft. And if we have a draft, you can be drafted. But we don't have a draft today. And the Pentagon self-imposed a requirement long before 9-11, but um, after the Vietnam War, that you had to have a green card in order to enlist in the military. And they asked Congress to pass a law in 2006 that made it a requirement of law that you had to have a green card to join the military. 
What the Pentagon didn't know, though, was that the supply of green card holders had dried up because the legal immigration system was broken. So it was no longer possible for someone to get off the boat at Ellis Island and immediately get a green card. Instead, people were on 15, 20, 105 year waiting lists to get green cards. So imposing this green card requirement had actually dried up the manpower for the United States military, the immigrant manpower. And that was one of the reasons why we got attacked on 9-11. On 9-11, if you know anything about it, um, we had intercepts in our possession in foreign languages that told us that we were gonna be attacked. But they hadn't been translated. And the reason they hadn't been translated was because we did not have enough translators in the United States military to do those translations. And one of the reasons we didn't have enough translators in the military to do those translations is because we had basically stopped recruiting immigrants unless they had a green card. So this is one of the great tragedies of 9-11. Now, the laws had started keeping people out of the military, but the immigrants in the military were superstars. The Center for Naval Analysis did a study November 2011. They said that immigrants were only 4% of enlisted accessions. Accessions means people in the ranks, people coming in. It's a fancy military term for you know, hiring you accessions. So they're only 4%. They were 12% of the general US population but they're only 4% of the military. The ones who were in the military, though, were staying in longer, they were re-enlisting at higher rates, and they were far less likely than citizen recruits to a trip. A trip is a Pentagon term for drop out. So this was a superstar group of people that was being underutilized. This is what led to Mavni, and this is the, the thing that I thought of that um, they gave me the, uh, the genius, so-called genius award for. Uh, I was the officer that thought of the possibility of expanding recruitment of immigrants to people who didn't have green cards. This eventually became the program known as Military Accessions Vital to the National Interest. I got to brief this to a general officer in about five minutes in the fall of 2007. The general liked the idea. He put me on active duty temporarily in January 2008, and he told me, you will get off active duty, Colonel Stock, when you get this program through the Pentagon. I wanted to get off active duty because I had a law practice that I wanted to get back to. So I was highly motivated to get off active duty. I went to see a, for, a friend of mine who had been a former service secretary and worked at the Pentagon because I'd never worked at the Pentagon. I said, how do I get this program through the Pentagon as fast as possible? He looked at me gravely and he said, the Pentagon crushes great ideas. He said, if you get this through and I predict it will fail, it will take you at least five years to get this through the Pentagon. I was proud to say, I'm still proud to say, in May 2008, five months after I started working on this project, the Secretary of the Army signed off on it. And in November 2008, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates signed off on it. And we were up and running. So it was less than a year, and I got to you know, tell my friend that, hey, you know, you're wrong about that. Sweet moment. Okay, so US population today is about 13.1% foreign born. That is a huge percentage of the population. It's the largest percentage since the great wave of immigration at the turn of the century, right before World War I. Most of these folks are off limits to the US military. They're off limits because they have to get a green card to get in, and as we said, it's five to 15 years. Most people, for example, if you come as a foreign student and you're attending Claremont McKenna College, you graduate, you get your OPT, you get your H-1B, by the time you're 35 and you have your green card, you're too old to join the United States military. So the Pentagon had put all these folks off limits. And there was also a demographic problem happening. And I want to show you this because I think it's really important. The left side here is the United States in 1950. It's broken down by age cohort. So the old people, 80 and older, are at the top, that little tiny green box up there. And then down at the bottom, that big red bar is the zero to four year olds. And then everybody else in between. The one on the right is the United States in 2050 as the US government's projecting through the US Census Bureau. The picture on the left is a Pentagon dream. The picture on the right is a Pentagon nightmare. Okay, why is that? What's this, uh, what's this blue bar here? That's you. No. Who's gonna be over 80 in 2050? Anybody here? Me, okay, all right. So, the one on the left is a Pentagon dream because there's lots of young people and they're gonna grow up 
and they're going to be available to serve in the United States military and go to work, and they're going to fund the Social Security Entitlement Program, and they're going to be taxpayers, and they're going to be scientists, and so forth. The one on the right is a manpower problem for the Pentagon. The manpower pool is basically flat, and everybody's fighting over those people. Google wants them, Microsoft wants them, the Border Patrol wants them, the United States military wants them, you know, everybody. Those are the workers of the future, and there's not enough of them demographically. Okay, and this has already started to affect the United States military. This is a very scary slide, and it has a bunch of acronyms on it. You don't have to know what it means. I'm going to point out the important stuff. This is an actual Army slide, PowerPoint slide. You know, the Pentagon loves PowerPoint, right? This is a Pentagon PowerPoint slide from the fall of 2007. In the fall of 2007, the Pentagon was having a huge recruiting crisis. They were giving $40,000 quick ship bonuses to anybody who was willing to sign up for the military and ship out immediately to basic training. They did not have enough people. There's two wars going on. The economy was booming, and Americans were not signing up for the military. The ranks of the military were depleted. The only way to fill them was to give people a lot of money as an incentive to join. And this is a slide that the Pentagon was showing to generals to scare them. And they were talking about the fact that the vast majority of Americans can no longer qualify for military service. The important point is up there, that exploding little thing in the top there on the right. Less than three out of 10 are qualified to serve in the military. Why are people not qualified? Criminal record, can't graduate from high school, obesity, gross obesity in the American public. Other problems that are referred to up there as the medically, morally dependent and overweight problems. So three out of 10 are the only ones qualified to serve. Most people can't serve, 70% can't serve. And of the three out of 10, everybody's fighting over those folks. Everybody wants, wants to recruit them. So this is a problem for the Pentagon and it's not actually getting any better, it's worse today. So who's in the United States who's available to be recruited? Well, this slide shows you the groups of people who are in America, and the public isn't really aware of all this, but of course we have native-born citizens. Those are people born in America and are citizens as a result of the 14th Amendment. We have naturalized citizens. Those are people who were born a foreigner, but they raised their right hand and became an American later in life. We have U.S. nationals, small group of them. They're people from American Samoa and Swains Island. They're born in those places, but they're not incorporated territories of the United States, so they're not American citizens at birth. There's a small group of them. And then we have what we call lawful permanent residents and conditional lawful permanent residents. The public knows these folks as green card holders. So we have green card holders. Then we also have the non-immigrant legal aliens, and we have a whole bunch of them who raised their hand earlier tonight. Okay, so raise your hand again if you're an F1 or a J1 or an H1. Look at all these people. These are the non-immigrant legal aliens. Don't have green cards, okay? And then we have the unauthorized aliens. So before the MAVNI program came along, the US military was only recruiting native-born citizens, naturalized citizens, nationals, and green card holders. And all those non-immigrant legal aliens, all those people who raised their hand, were off limits to the US military. They could not be recruited. And of course, the unauthorized aliens were also off limits. So my idea was simply that we expand the recruiting pool. We start recruiting all the people who are here legally, but who don't yet have green cards and aren't gonna be able to get them until they're 35 or so. So that was this genius idea that the MacArthur Foundation decided that they were gonna recognize. Okay, so what happened? Well, this is an example. This is a real letter. This was written by somebody named Tatiana. She wrote a letter to the Army General in charge of Army recruiting. This is a direct quote from her letter. Um, she was in the U.S. legally on an H-4, which is a kind of non-immigrant visa attached to her father's H-1B professional worker visa. She'd grown up in America, essentially. She'd gone to high school here. She'd taken college courses. And she realized that something bad was going to happen very shortly. She was going to turn 21. And an H-4 who turns 21 has to go back to their home country. They lose their eligibility to ride with their parents. So when she turned 21, she was going to have to go back to Moldova and wait there probably for about 11 years while her father applied for a green card. She would have to stay unmarried, have her file, father file a petition for her. She'd have to wait in those proverbial backlogs. And then eventually, someday when she was in her 30s, she would get to come back to the United States. But somebody had told her that if she could join the military, her problems were solved. 
because she wasn't going to have to go back to Moldova. She could stay in America. And so she wrote a letter to the United States Army Accessions Command asking, hey, I was hoping I could join the Army, and oh, by the way, I also want to go to help get GI Bill to go to school. At the time she wrote this letter, the Army had to write her back and say, sorry, unless you have a green card, which she couldn't get, um, you're going to have to go back to Moldova. We can't recruit you. Or you could change to an F1 student visa, you know, go to college for a long time. But she'd been in America for a really long time, and she felt like this was her home. So this was one of the examples we used of the type of people that we wanted to recruit. Now, interestingly, the other part of the, uh, the genius thing here was I had pointed out to the Pentagon that they already had the legal authority to recruit all these people. And they had the, the legal authority to turn them into citizens. It was legal authority dating back to World War I. Because there was a law on the books that said any alien who serves in the United States military during wartime and who serves honorably can go straight to American citizenship immediately, which in bureaucratic terms meant about six months. So any illegal immigrant who got drafted like that guy during the Vietnam War, he had, they turned him into a citizen because he was serving honorably in the United States military. He got Congressional Medal of Honor, right? That's honorable. Okay. So I pointed this law out to the Pentagon, and my proposal was to simply recruit these people. And as I mentioned, I told you the story. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates approved the program. This is a picture of the first group of MAVNIs being sworn in in Times Square, New York, in April 2009. We, we got the authority for the pilot program in November 2008, and they agreed to run it as a pilot the following year. And we had, it took us a while to get everything up and running. So April 2009, the first group were being sworn in by General Casey, Chief of Staff of the United States Army, in Times Square, New York. And there's some interesting characters in the crowd here. You can see this picture, by the way, in the New York Times, because they did a story about it. There's a woman from India in the front row who has a master's degree in engineering. She has just joined the Army. There's a Harvard graduate in the second row there who's got a master's degree from Harvard School of Education. Uh, he's still in the Army today, and he's in Special Forces. There's a guy on the right here. There's a hand in front of his face, but he looks kind of Asian. He's actually Norwegian. And what had happened was his Chinese parents had moved to Norway, and he was born in Norway. And so he grew up speaking Norwegian, Swedish, Mandarin, Chinese, English, and one other language that I can never remember. And he said, he came to America to get a master's degree. He said he never felt at home in Norway because people looked at him and he didn't look, you know, the traditional Norwegian ethnic group. So he, but he said in America he felt at home. We were the place, kind of place that welcomed diversity and felt right at home here. So he joined the Army. These are just some examples of some of the folks that signed up that day, but there were a lot of them. In fact, we had so many people trying to sign up for this program that we had to cap the program. We had 16,000 people trying to sign up for 1,000 slots in the program. Okay. Uh, the law that allowed us to do that was very old, and it said a person can be naturalized whether or not he has been lawfully admitted to the United States for permanent residence if he serves honorably in an active duty status or as a member of the selected reserve during wartime. So that was the law that let us do that. And there was also an enlistment law that came into effect. Uh, this law was passed in 2006. It was the first time in American history that military recruiting was restricted to green card holders only during wartime. But Congress luckily had put an escape valve, and the escape valve was the secretary concerned may authorize the enlistment of a person not described above if the secretary determines that such enlistment is vital to the national interest. And that's how we came up with the acronym military accessions vital to the national interest. We were using this exception in the law in order to make our case. So we used existing laws and we did an analysis. We looked at who's out there. Uh, we briefly discussed the idea of a foreign legion, right? The foreign legion's famous. We decided we did not want a foreign legion. If any of you know about the foreign legion, you'll know why, okay? We didn't want a foreign legion. We also decided we weren't gonna go to unauthorized immigrants because the DREAM Act was supposed to get passed and they would be covered by that. And it's actually a problem for the Pentagon to recruit people who don't have social security numbers and don't have a record with the Department of Homeland Security. It's, it poses a significant bureaucratic hurdle. So we put the unauthorized immigrants off limits. We decided to recruit the rest of the folks who were legal non-green card holders, non-lawful permanent residents. And there's 80 plus different categories of these folks, but some of them are F1 foreign students, J1 exchange visitors, O for outstanding, a Q for cultural exchange visitor, R for religious worker, um, you know, the whole alphabet soup of, of visa categories. Some of these folks live in America, as I said, for 20 years. If you're an e-visa holder, you own a small business, you can live here as long as you own the business, but you can never get a green card. 
and those e-visa holders' kids wanted to join the military. Uh, Treaty NAFTA, we also recruited the Treaty NAFTA people, okay? Um, so these are some of the categories, and then asylees, refugees, and people with temporary protected status. So we decided to go after these folks and recruit them. They announced the recruiting program, and originally, because I was an Army officer and I thought of it, they said there's going to be 1,000 slots, and the Army gets 890. Um, the Air Force got 10, and the Navy got 100. And the Army stole the Navy slots back out at the end of the year when the Navy didn't use them. Um, the Marines declined to participate. So it was a one-year pilot program initially. It was wildly successful. They renewed it. It's back in effect again this year. This year, they have started with a quota of 1,500 per year, but they're telling me they're going to raise it because the military is having big recruiting problems. In order to qualify for this program, you have to be legally in the U.S. for at least two years. You have to be legally in the U.S. on the day you sign your enlistment contract. You have to be in one of the legal statuses that the Pentagon has decided are eligible. They don't want to recruit people from the baggage claim at LAX. So you have to have been here you know, in a legal status for a certain amount of time, so no visitors to the US are allowed. Okay. And again, the program's been wildly successful. They also put some other requirements in, and these are intended to get to the vital to the national interest. You either had to be, and still today have to be, a US licensed healthcare professional, meaning like a doctor who's licensed in America, or you had to speak one of numerous strategic languages, not to include Spanish. Sorry about all the Spanish speakers here. I identified earlier. Um, so this is the list of all the languages that the Pentagon is looking for. And if you speak one of these languages and you're an F1, not that I'm here to recruit any Claremont McKenna students, but um, you might be eligible to serve in the United States military and go straight to citizenship. Uh, the ones in red, by the way, are the, uh, the top five, they call them where they get an overwhelming number of recruits. In fact, there were so many Korean speakers trying to beat down the doors to join the Army under this program when we first announced it that the Wall Street Journal ran a hilarious story with the headline, Korean Invasion Blindsides the Army in a Good Way. And it was about how there were 890 slots in the Army for these Mavnies, and there were like 3,000 Koreans camped out at Fort Hamilton, New York, trying to join the Army under the program on the first day it opened. Um, so it was kind of, they had to put a cap on Korean language temporarily. Uh, but they've started recruiting Koreans again. So this is an example, you had to be one of these. And then you had to agree to go on active duty for a certain period of time. Or if you're a healthcare professional, you had a choice of reserve or active duty. Um, you're eligible to become an American citizenship immediately, to become an American citizen immediately. You skip the green card completely. So no green card for these folks. They go straight from F1 to US citizen in 10 weeks which is pretty amazing. You skip, that's why I mean uh, we were exploiting the dysfunction of the legal immigration system. A smart person graduating from a top college in America would go, gosh, I'm an F1 student. It's going to take me 15 years to get a green card and then another five years to get American citizenship. If I join the Army, I can be an American citizen in 10 weeks and I can skip the close relationship with the immigration lawyer and the thousands of dollars and all that. People are rational, so lots of people made the decision to join the military. Now the kick kicker is, the law also says that if you don't serve honorably for five years total in active duty or reserve both, you lose your citizenship. You can lose your citizenship. And all the recruits were told that. We put it in their contract that you have to apply for American citizenship. If you don't serve for five years, you can lose it. But people were willing to take that chance. Okay, and this is an example. I love this picture because as I said, the Marine Corps was not participating in Mavni. This young man is wearing a US Army jersey He's breaking the tape at the Marine Corps Marathon in Washington, D.C. He was recruited for his Swahili language skills. It also just so happens that he was an NCAA All-American athlete at Crimson Tide. Um, we didn't ask him about that when he joined the Army. We just tested him on Swahili. Uh, the Army knew that they had something special because they sent him to basic training. Who's in the Army here? I got some ROTC. He uh, was lapping people on the two-mile run. Okay. So the Army said, God, this guy can run. Let's send him to the Army World Class Athlete Program and see what he can do. So they sent him to Colorado Springs and they trained him. And uh, he, they sent him to the San Antonio Rock and Roll Half Marathon. This was the first time he'd ever run a half marathon in his life. He won one hour and four minutes. So the Army said, gosh, this guy can run. This soldier can run a half marathon. Let's try him on a marathon. So we'll send him to the Marine Corps Marathon, which is America's premier volunteer armed services marathon. So in 2012, they sent Augustus Mayo to the Marine Corps Marathon, first marathon he'd ever run. 
He won. He's breaking the tape. There's nobody behind him. Okay, his time was a little bit slow because Hurricane Sandy was blowing in that day. So it was like two hours and 17 minutes. But there's like nobody behind the guy, okay? And there's a headwind, right? So this was not the only Mavni to win the Marine Corps Marathon. This year there were Mavnis that came in first and second. Okay, and they're Swahili speakers. I don't quite know what the correlation is there, but we'll figure it out. All right, so we also saved the military a huge amount of money with this program. This is a chart showing the attrition rate for American citizens stacked up against Mavnis. Uh, the American citizens are the back row there, the non-Mavnis. And you can see at 24 months, 20.5% of Americans who join the Army drop out by two years. Of course, that represents a huge loss of money because you've invested money in somebody and they just finished their training and they're in their unit and they're gone. Okay? The Mavnis, the dropout rate was only 7.8%, and that was mainly for injuries not for conduct or bad behavior or anything like that, okay? So that was a huge cost savings. And then language ability, the Mavnis were saving the government hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is a chart that shows the, the kind of greenish color line there on the left. Those are the scores that graduates of the Defense Language Institute get after one year of intensive language training at taxpayer expense at Monterey, California. So we take a soldier, we send the soldier off to DLI in Monterey, California for a whole year, they do an immersion program, and at the end of that year, they can score one or one plus, which is a relatively low score, on the oral proficiency interview in the language that they're studying. Of course, the government's spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to send each soldier to that language institute. The Mavnis were scoring, they're the blue graph there, they were scoring much higher native level proficiency in these languages, and it wasn't costing the government anything. Now, the interesting thing is you say, well, the Mavnis aren't scoring that high. Well, the Mavnis had a problem, right? We were capping some of the languages that were popular. So Hindi was, running, was getting capped right away. So the Mavnis wanted to join the military. Their language was closed. They had to go on YouTube and watch videos in another language and get up to speed in another language to test because they couldn't get into the military. So the numbers there are a little bit funny because it might be a native-born Hindi speaker, but he's testing in Urdu, or he's testing in some other language that he doesn't actually speak that well, but he's doing better than the DLI people that we spent a lot of money on. So this was a great example of the money that we saved. And of course, our crowning achievement, uh, this is in 2012, this is Saral Shretha. In 2012, he became the U.S. Army Soldier of the Year. He was an F1 student from Nepal, descended from a Gurkha family. He came to the U.S. to study computer science. He was going to school in Nebraska. He found out about the Mavni program. He dropped out of school. He joined the Army. He was all excited. Hey, I'm from a Gurkha heritage. I want to serve in the U.S. military. He went to Afghanistan. He did really well there. Got a bunch of medals. He came back. He competed in this multi-level competition that's open to every soldier in the Army. It's called the U.S. Army Soldier of the Year competition. And he was named the best soldier in the whole entire United States Army after a rigorous competition. And he was one of our Mavni soldiers. Now, this was nothing new, and so I'm a little bit embarrassed to be called a genius for thinking of this. Up there on the slide, you have, from Gettysburg, examples of immigrants that we have recruited in the past in the memorial to the Irish Brigade. And then on the right, a book about immigrants serving in the military in World War I. So this idea that I thought of wasn't really new. It was just a matter of knowing military history and knowing what the law was. Immigrants have been recruited in World War I, They've been recruited in the Civil War. They've been recruited in all of other Ameri America's other wars. And it was just a little bit of a tragedy that it took America so long to figure out after 9-11 that we needed to draw on this natural strength that we had. People who had voluntarily relocated to the United States and were interested in serving in America's military. So this is a story of the Mavni program. And it brings me back to some concepts I learned at the Army War College where I was taught that national power has to do with your population your resources, and your geography. But population is really the key. And if you can bring the most talented, get you know, uh, people that are energetic and are willing to contribute to your society, you are going to be the most powerful nation on earth. That's a lesson that we learned historically, but we seem to have forgotten it recently. I'm hoping, ho though, that this is going to change as we educate Congress about the realities of our demographic changes and our need to pay attention to the components of our population if we want to maintain our national power. I'm hoping that Congress is going to think about immigration in a less 
passionate way and maybe return to some reason. And one of the bills that I do support is the DREAM Act, because I think the DREAM Act is a great bill that would allow young people who have grown up and been educated in America to get green cards and serve in America's military. They wouldn't be coerced into serving, they'd have other options, but one option open to them would be to serve in America's military and to meet our shortage of military manpower needs. I think it's kind of a tragedy that we're educating kids and then as soon as they get to the point where they're gonna contribute to our society, they're gonna start working, paying taxes, we tell them they can't work and we try to deport them. I think it would be smarter to take a rocket scientist and have him join the United States Navy rather than deporting him to Venezuela so he could work for Hugo Chavez. I think that's a bad idea, okay? So I do support this bill and I'm hoping that the, they're gonna uh, start being reasonable. I started this talk by telling you law is reason free from passion. Of course, immigration law is not passion free from reason. But I'm hoping that if I talk to enough people and other people like me start talking about the realities of our nation's immigration system, we can return to a little more reason in the immigration code. Thank you very much. Okay, and we have a Q&A, and yeah. I'm over time. So. We will now be taking questions. Please wait for Kala or myself to come to you with a microphone. Thank you for your speech. Um, I have two questions. So first is, how is the screening process for MAVNI, and how did you compromise, I guess, the, the threat of national security, the risk of it, um, for a screening process? And the second is, as the military becomes less dependent on the raw population and more dependent on technology, how do you think that would change the dynamics of uh, legislation such as MAVNI? Okay, very good questions. First, we were very concerned about the possibility that some foreign infiltrator might try to get into the military through the program. Um, the first strength of the program was that we were only taking people who are legally here in the U.S. Those of you who are F1s know that you go through a rigorous process to get cleared by the U.S. government, the State Department and Department of Homeland Security before you come to the U.S. So we actually had more screening data on all these people we were recruiting than we had on American citizens. We had a big DHS database, we had biometrics, we had reports from the SEVIS system, you know, we had all kinds of information. On top of that, we did a check of multiple US government databases, we did credit report checks, and we did something on every MAVNI called a single scope background investigation. This is an investigation that's done for people, normally for American citizens who are eligible for a top secret clearance, we weren't given any of the MAVNIs a security clearance, but we did the single scope background investigation on all of them. This requires an extensive interview. We talked to their employers, we talked to their college professors, we talked to fellow students, roommates, all that sort of thing. It's a six month long investigation and they're only allowed to enlist if they pass it. So the MAVNIs actually get more screening than anybody who is trying to enlist in the US military today. Now that's not a guarantee, but we don't have the same screening on American citizens who are joining or on green card holders who are joining. Okay, so that's um, the first point. Second one, uh, if we care about STEM, we need to recruit foreign students because that's science, technology, engineering, and math, and that's the population that's studying those fields. So the program's actually more valuable because we now need more people with technology backgrounds. And we need people who speak foreign languages at a fluent level so they can read you know, some hacker's information on a web page that's written in some slang you know, that they don't teach at the Defense Language Institute. So I think the programs become more valuable as a result of that need. I hope that answers your questions. Okay, okay thank you so much for your talk. Um, looking at the slide, it's really easy to understand how successful the program has been so far. But one of the questions that I had was, um, have you encountered much in the way of pushback or challenges uh, to what you've put together so far? I know immigration is an issue that can be very passionate, very charged. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering uh, if, if you've encountered people that just don't buy it, don't like it, and how you've dealt with the challenges that you've encountered. Well, I, I think always, anytime you talk about immigration, you have some people that don't like whatever you're planning to propose. But frankly, we didn't get any pushback from the Pentagon, any significant pushback, because military leaders know what the need is. Um, as far as the politics go, it's, it's interesting to me, but bipartisan support across the board. In fact, uh, Tea Party Republican Mike Kaufman, who's from Colorado, has introduced a bill that would make this program permanent by law. And that's because he sees the value of it. And it's on both sides of the aisle. Uh, it's a very simple program. You know, It capitalizes on what America's good at. The military's very good at integrating people from foreign cultures. That's always been our strength. And I also think the key thing you point to is that 
immigrant participation in the military right now is so low. And it's because the legal immigration system is broken. So we can make our, our military much stronger if we just return to the historical levels that we had in past wars. And I think that makes sense to people regardless of what their ideology is. Uh, and also, again, we're recruiting legal immigrants. So I think people are less uh, inclined to be opposed to the concept that you know, we're letting somebody into the military who's perfectly legal. DHS has cleared them. I forgot to mention DHS clears every single recruit that comes in through the MAVNI program. They have a special process to set up where they check all their records and they clear everybody. So we have not actually encountered much in the way of opposition, except maybe some you know, kind of emotional people haven't really thought it through or don't know that these folks are legal and they've cleared all these background checks. Another question. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so just speaking as somebody who isn't an immigrant himself, but the child of immigrants, um, I know a lot of people who are like me and who have similar interests in joining the military, uh, either through officer accession or enlisted accession. Do you have any research on the, I guess, statistics of people like me who would like to join the military and might otherwise be similarly motivated to stay in it as MAVNI accessions were throughout their time? Um, they don't, the Pentagon doesn't break out uh, American citizens who join the military based on their generational, you know, how long they've been in the country. So there actually isn't data on that. But um, my knowledge of general past sociological studies is that America's pretty good at integrating people. So there's not like a huge difference between the immigrants in certain ethnic groups versus like two generations, three generations. There are significant differences though um, across ethnic groups. And the Marine Corps in particular has done a bunch of studies and found out that Latino men are extremely good recruits for the United States military, um, or for at least for the Marine Corps, regardless of how many generations they've been in the country. But the more recent ones are also more likely to stay in the Marine Corps, re-enlist in the Marine Corps, less likely to drop out of basic training. And they have some sociological reasons why they think that's the case, having to do with cultural and family background issues and that sort of thing. Um, the Marine Corps found that they get their best bang for the buck by recruiting an American citizen of Latino descent who has just graduated from high school in California. <laughs> least likely to drop out, least likely to misbehave, most likely to re-enlist. You know, go figure. Who's the worst bet? Anybody know? A white female like me. Least likely to stay in the military, less like, least likely to join, most likely to drop out. And I stayed in for 28 years, so there's always outliers, I guess. Okay, other questions? Uh, hi, thank you for coming. Um, again, uh, I, have, I had the opportunity as well as some other students to have a small meeting with you and we got to listen a lot to your knowledge. But I don't know, it's just being in this institution, I wanted to see if you could touch on, on and you talked about it during the small meeting, but I think a lot of the people here will benefit from hearing this, especially since um, I tend to have these conversations with people around the school, but they're not as receptive. So I think if they hear it, coming from another person as yourself, maybe they'll be more willing to it. And that will be the reasons why a lot of these immigrants come to the United States, especially like undocumented immigrants. Oh, the reasons why undocumented immigrants come? Okay, um, in my experience, there's uh, two main, well, three main drivers, I guess. Family's already here, and you wanna be with your family. And there's no way for people to come legally to be with their family, so they come unlawfully because family is a he basic human drive, and. People don't like to be separated for 105 years. You know, they want to be with their family. So they get desperate. They want to come to be with their family. Um, family values, I think, are something all Americans can embrace, and we can understand that. Okay. Um, second reason is jobs. If you don't have a job in your home country and you're starving and you can't make a living and there's a job in America, you will come to America. Uh, the founders knew this. You know, one of our basic freedoms, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you know, Declaration of Independence. I mean, the idea was people should be able to go to a place where they can make a living and survive, right? And so lots of people come for jobs. And then the last one is, in today's world, they're fleeing violence. Um, we have tremendous number of refugees. We have, a, in today's world, it's, it's just a world record for refugees. And most of them aren't here in North America and South America. Most of them are in the Middle East or Africa. But people are fleeing violence. They have no choice, so they head for the United States if they can get here. And we have something we call territorial access to asylum. You can't claim asylum in America unless you can get here. So you have to be at the border and claim asylum, or you have to be inside America. We don't let people apply for asylum overseas. We just don't allow it. 
So if you're a refugee or overseas, unless you get picked for that small quota of refugees who get to come to America, you can't walk into an embassy in Norway and claim asylum. They just don't let you do that. So you have to get to our borders, and that's one of the reasons why this past summer we had all those people coming up to the border, uh, because that's the only way you can claim asylum. You have to walk up to the border and say, I claim asylum. Uh, or you have to fly in, get in somehow, you know, illegally with papers. Um, they won't give you a visitor visa because you want to claim asylum. That's a reason for being turned down for a visitor visa or a student visa. If you walk into a U.S. Embassy and you say, I want to claim asylum in America, you're immediately put on the blacklist for not getting a visa. You can't get a visa. Um, and that's how we control the flow, so to speak, and we make sure all those people stay in other places so they don't overwhelm us. I hope that answers your question. Anyone else? Guys right. are being nice. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, do you have a projected growth for the program, and also why did the Marine Corps not join into the program? Okay, I'll answer the second one first. The Marine Corps told me they weren't participating, participating because they didn't want to recruit any illegal immigrants. So I said, okay. The Army will continue to win the Marine Corps Marathon as long as you don't readjust your thinking. You know? um, I'm actually hoping the Marine Corps will see my slideshow one of these days and you know, they'll kind of get the idea. Um, the Air Force saw the light, the Navy saw the light. Uh, the Army's just been getting incredible results from this program. Uh, right now it's still capped, but the Army just missed its recruiting goals for the last couple of months. So they're talking about lifting the cap higher because the quality of the people we're getting is just so tremendous. And I'll give you another example. I didn't put his picture up there because he, he's shy, but uh, the Army recruited a MIT master's degree, two master's degrees. He's got two master's degrees, one in nuclear engineering and one in nuclear policy. And he's going to MIT and he was in a PhD program at MIT to get another nuclear related degree. And he looked into the future and saw that you can't get export control, you know, security clearance, all this stuff if you're not an American citizen. So he went to an immigration lawyer and the immigration lawyer said, well, after you get your PhD, we'll try to get you an H-1B and then we'll try to get you a green card as an outstanding professor or researcher or whatever. And sometime when you're about 38, 39, you might have a green card. And so then he said, to the, he went to the Army recruiter, and the Army recruiter said, I can make you a citizen in 10 weeks. Okay, and if you're in nuclear policy, um, that's the gold ring, is American citizenship, because you can now work you know, for the US government doing what you love to do. Um, he's from Nepal, and he was actually on a big scholarship to MIT, and so MIT gave him a leave of absence, so he can go back after he does his enlisted time and be a you know, PhD at MIT. And uh, he joined the Army, he got a citizenship in 10 weeks. The Army, in its infinite wisdom, made him a chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear specialist, which is kind of a low-ranking guy who washes trucks that have been contaminated by um, you know, nuclear material or chemical material. Uh, I suspect he was a problem in training because he was probably correcting all of his instructors, telling them that their information was incorrect or out of date. Uh, but he's been very successful and he's now about to become an officer in the US Army and get a uh, clearance and everything. Um, very, very successful guy. So that's just an example of you know, the talent that's out there to serve America's national security that, that could be put to use. But we put these artificial barriers in place to prevent people from doing what they love. Um, and it's unfortunate. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. Another one. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm just wondering if the same philosophy of MAVNI would apply to other field, because a strong nation is not only a strong army, but also strong in other fields. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, there's no law that lets people become citizens immediately except the military law. So they would have to pass a law through Congress that allowed other people to ha confer the same advantages. In the Senate bill, the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill from a couple years ago, there was a provision in there that um, was going to allow DOD to turn people into citizens immediately. It was modeled on MAVNI. If they worked in De Department of Defense scientific laboratories or at the RAND Corporation, unfortunately, it didn't pass. But they were going to basically give you a job at RAND, and you were going to get your citizenship if you agreed to work for them for five years. And they, they told me they modeled it off MAVNI. You know, it was straight off MAVNI, but it didn't pass. So I think you're right. It's a great idea. Whether we can get Congress to do it, different story. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have a simple question, though the, probably the answer is not that simple. Um, how does the like, great results of your program, maybe showing that to more and more like, high-powered officials and members of government um, and other branches, 
how is that, how do you see that affecting immigration law as a whole, its improvement, maybe streamlining it, or just expanding it in general to accept more people? Uh, well, that's a very good question. I think one of the things I've noticed is that there's a great deal of ignorance out there about the immigration system, and it's a function of the fact that the law is so complicated. Uh, most members of the public have no idea how difficult it is to get a green card. Most military leaders have no idea. So it doesn't occur to people that this is a problem. You know, everybody thinks, oh, America's got 320 million people, we always have enough people, you know, and they don't realize that all these people are barred from military service. Um, the American public doesn't realize that only three out of 10 Americans are qualified for military service. That's like an unknown thing. So, you know, I think the best way is I try to educate people, I try to give talks, that's why I'm so happy to be here. I like to educate future leaders of America about some of these facts. Uh, but there is a tremendous amount of wrong information out there in the news media, and so I think change is gonna come as people start to get educated and as people start to realize some of the implications of the demographic changes that we're facing. And it, looking around the world, you can see it happening to other countries, and it's gonna happen to us too if we don't wake up and watch what's happening. Hi, I don't, um, anyways. Um, <laughs> with tell them, with, who, you, tell with, them who you are. I, Oh, I'm Camilo. Hi, everyone. Camilo. Some of you know me. Um, uh, with the deferred action, are you guys looking to expand MAVNI to include students who are part of that program? Okay, that's a great question. I passed over this because I was watching the clock and I realized I was running out of time. Uh, President Obama ordered the Pentagon to allow the deferred action for childhood arrivals people to be allowed to enlist. And the Secret uh, Secretary of Homeland Security and the, the Secretary of Defense authorized their enlistment last September, but they messed up. Um, they only authorized their enlistment if they qualify for the MAVNI program. Okay, now this is a problem, and I'll kind of go, probably have to go back to the slide. Um, as I told you, the MAVNI program is kind of limited to certain groups of people, and in order to get into this program, um, you have to be one of these people. You either have to be a U.S. licensed healthcare professional, which basically means a doctor, or you have to speak one of these strategic languages. The vast majority of the people who have deferred action for childhood arrivals speak Spanish, and Spanish is not on the list. Um, there are no DACAs who are doctors because medical schools in the United States didn't start admitting undocumented students until this fall. They admitted seven at Loyola. Okay, so. There's no DACAs who can qualify as healthcare professionals. Um, there are about 16,000 people in line already for the 1,500 slots for the other languages. So they opened up the MAVNI program to the DACAs. Uh, so far, we have had one DACA who's qualified for enlistment, and that DACA has not passed the single scope background investigation yet. We're not sure he can pass it because the single scope background investigation checks whether you broke any laws um, it checks whether you've ever worked illegally, you know, all kinds of stuff that DACAs probably can't pass. Uh, when the White House was thinking about putting the DACAs in, I actually told them I thought they should have a separate program for the DACAs, not one that required them to be healthcare professionals or proficient at one of these languages. Um, the DACAs are, are not that dangerous a population because they've lived in the U.S. for at least five years and they came as kids, and, but most of them don't speak one of these languages. We've had, you know, a few that speak some of these languages in Korean and Chinese and so forth. Uh, but basically, they're going to get shut out of this because there's too many people ahead of them that are more qualified. And so it's kind of unfortunate because they are very talented. And you're going to start seeing a movie getting advertised in the next few weeks called Spare Parts, which used to be called La Vida Robot. It's about four undocumented immigrants, uh, I think all from Mexico, who were part of the Carl Hayden High School team that won the underwater robot competition. Um, they beat MIT and came in first, even though they were from a very underprivileged high school in Phoenix, Arizona, the Carl Hayden High School, um, they went to this national rocket underwater robot competition and won. And I think it's a tragedy for America and for Americans' military that we don't let folks like that you know, join the Navy. Uh, they could make great contributions as winners of the national underwater robot competition to you know, the United States Navy. Um, but we don't, those, none of those people would qualify under the MAVN program because they all speak Spanish and it's not one of the languages, and they're not doctors. Um, so I would like to see a separate recruiting program, you know, because the, the legal authority's there. They're just, if they're make, forcing them into these two brackets, they just can't qualify. 
But the same laws that we use for the Mavni program could be used to allow the DACAs to enlist without having a quota or anything like that, and it would help the military a lot. So thank you for that question. Are we done? It's about eight, if there are no more questions. All right, it's been my pleasure to be with you tonight, and thank you so much. <laughs>